Welcome to Career Tools. Today's topic, what to take to an interview. Here we go. I don't know about you, Mark, but in my experience, man, I have seen everything. I mean, (laughs) I see people who come into an interview and they look like they've been away for like seven weeks. They've been doing Uh, seven weeks of interviews and judging by the size of the bag they have, they brought all their travel stuff with them, right? Yeah. They ask every one of their friends, what should I bring? And their friends said, this, 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 and this. And so they all went to all, they took every single piece of advice from all their friends and they have a satchel. <laughs> a satchel. A couple satchels. Yeah. And then there are folks who show up and they have nothing. 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 One guy actually had to ask me to borrow a pen to take some notes. It's like, okay, dude. Yeah. Uh, bring a pen and a piece of paper at least. Yeah. So it, <laughs> it's all over the place, right? You got people who want to show us their artist portfolio. Some people who pull out a large sheet of paper out of their bag and then start drawing yeah, the intricacies no, oh, of yeah. their, their invention they want to share with us. Yeah. So there's a whole wide range of behaviors in interviews. Yeah. Visual aids, visual aids, folks, bad idea. Unless you're a graphic artist and they've specifically said, we're going to spend this interview going over your work or we're going to, we're going to work together on something. Visual aids and interviewing are a no-go, a (laughs) non-starter. Yeah. So then the question is really, what are the right things to take to an interview? Yeah. This is, this is actually, gosh, we get this question a lot and It worries me in some ways because it tells you the level of simplicity that is not taken for granted in interviewing, right? People literally say, oh my gosh, interview, I don't know what to do. And they don't know what to do about anything, right? They they can't even say, okay, I'll take my resume and my keys and leave it at that. So it worries me. But nevertheless, here's what you do. You take a portfolio not an artist portfolio, folks, but a portfolio is just a simple way to contain your loose papers, okay? And then you put in the portfolio certain things, your resume, a work history sheet, your job description, correspondence, photo ID, pen and a small notebook paper, a small notebook paper or plain paper, your car key, not keys, folks, key, and in some cases, examples of your work. Uh, That's our second point, what to put in the portfolio. And the third point is do not take your phone and anything else not on the list that Wendy has compiled for us. Okay, do not take your phone. And for those of you who say, well, but I'm going to be walking around. I might need to get a text or whatever. No, don't take your phone. What we tell you is the complete list, and that's it. And in fact, in some cases, I would say there are things on this I wouldn't take. But that's it. Cool. Okay, so let's talk about the portfolio because... When we you first said that to me, I was like, a portfolio? You can't, yeah. A portfolio of my work? What are, you ta- what are you talking about? Yeah. A, a portfolio is a professional way to contain loose papers. It could be called a conference folder. It's either envelope shaped with a flap at the top or it's, it's book shaped. Uh, a lot of times I know at some hotels I stay at, they have a nice leather portfolio. It looks like a thick leather version of a file folder without the little tab at the top. And it's just a place where you could put 20 sheets of paper and it would still lay flat. Sometimes it has pockets on the inside. It can be leather or it could be synthetic. It wouldn't be paper. Okay. You wouldn't have a paper portfolio because a paper portfolio would start to look worn. Right. And and there's generally a size that are available, which allows you to put a standard size piece of paper easily into the portfolio that that's big enough. So it's going to be nine by 12, you know, a little bit bigger than eight and a half by 11 in in the States, a little bit bigger than a four in Europe. You don't want something enormous. You don't need legal size. We're not talking about portfolios that are, you know, two feet by two and a half feet that artists put drawings in. Yeah, because that's the image I had in my mind when you first said Yeah, exactly. Like, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, portfolio is actually very much more a European word than, than an American word. Americans think portfolio and they assume drawings or something like that. But that's, right. that is just a one type of portfolio. And um, 
You don't want something thicker than an inch. This is not the equivalent of a three ring binder with a spine on it, folks. The idea here is to have something large enough to contain the items you need for the meeting, for the interview, and nothing more. Why not a briefcase or something larger where you wouldn't have any space restrictions and you'd, you'd be able to make sure that you had everything you need? What's what's the, the appeal of a portfolio? Yeah, the problem with a briefcase is you're going to put too much in there and you're going to have to open the briefcase and take it out and then close the briefcase and then put everything back in. Look, you only want to have one object in your hands. That just makes things easier, right? You can shake hands. You can open doors. You can carry a cup of coffee, right? Interviews make people nervous. It's a fact. <laughs> I get nervous. Yeah. When Wendy says she gets nervous, I don't, I never felt nervous in my interviews. I was lucky. I was prepared. I had somebody who t- taught me how to interview and I had, had bad interviews before and learned and just recognize that, you know, we've said before about interviewing, it is an artificial reality. It's designed to keep you out. And if you recognize it as a completely different set of skills, you just prepare for that set of skills, right? Well, I think the analogy we've used before, I think I've shared it on, on air before, is if you're a football player in college in America and you win the Heisman Trophy, the number one football player in America in college for a given year, and you want to play in the NFL in professional football, an interview, if you had to interview, is a bit like the NFL saying you have to play tennis well in order to get into the NFL. And you would say to them, are you kidding me? I mean, I've never played tennis before. What does that have to do with football? And the answer is it has nothing to do with football, but that's the way we do it, right? Interviewing skills are artificial. You you can be a great interviewee and be horrible at the job you had and the job you're going into. You could be great at the job you're doing now, and you could be perfect for the job you're going into and not get it because you're terrible interviewing. And it's just a different set of skills. So for some reason, I got that. Um, I didn't feel no, I was excited. I felt like I had a competitive advantage. And, and of course, when you're interviewing, that means you don't have an offer, right? right? And so there are two parts to the process. There's getting offers and taking offers. And so I saw it as combat, right? You just have a chance to get an offer and and, and have somebody else not get one. Uh, and my goal was to get as many as I could. But look, the point is they make you nervous and having only one thing to handle or sweat over is a good thing. It really is. Now, look, you can buy a portfolio relatively cheaply from Staples or from Amazon. The only thing we recommend is when you do buy one, make sure it's the same price point as your suit, so to speak, right? No, so I got to buy a $1,000 uh, portfolio? Yeah, no, no, no. no. <laughs> I, I knew you were going to say I totally knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I could have said, so I have to buy a $150 portfolio? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, I, I have to tell you, I read an article recently. I want to say it was in Fortune about Men's Warehouse. And George Zimmerman, um, for those of you outside of the U.S., it's a chain of menswear stores that has grown in the last 30 years to be really quite significant in the U.S. And they really have good quality suits. I mean, it's not what they had in the beginning. They have much better quality now. And the prices are really, really good. And you and I have talked about even partnering with them in some way and say, look, you know, if we send somebody to you, give them a discount because we're going to talk about how great your guy's stuff is. And how professional um, your recommendations are. Now, I, I would need to do some mystery shopping and make sure they didn't recommend a check suit to go into an interview. But look, um, if you're a new graduate and your suit is from a chain store and it's relatively inexpensive, doesn't mean it's bad quality uh, as long as you've had it tailored, right? If it's relatively inexpensive, a portfolio from Staples or f- for under 20 bucks is fine, right? But, but if you're in a suit from Brooks Brothers and you expect to make six figures, then your portfolio needs to be from Smithson, which for you U.S. folks is a very high quality with a warrant from the Queen of England stationery store that sells leather goods as well, or some other high-end store. Not one that you need to see the brand name on, just something that looks high quality. Now, some of you might be saying, yeah, you know, I want to be a, a person of the people. I want to be a regular guy. I don't need, you know, even though I want to make six figures, I don't want them to think that I'm all about luxury. Well, too bad. You're wrong. This is not the time to be thinking that way. As I often hear people say when I used to work in politics, yeah, everybody talks about how the U.S. president always has people around him and they've got an entourage and a coterie of people and they've got, he's got a bulletproof car and all this security and everything else. Yeah. And we don't need all those fancy people at the top. And then you say, yeah, but I don't want my neighbor being president of the United States. There are too many big decisions. So in this case, appearance counts, 
consistency of your overall appearance counts. Your $50 scuffed shoes that are unshined and don't have edge dressing on the soles with a $500 suit. We notice, folks. I promise you we notice. And not in a good way. <laughs> yeah. And, and look, we notice and we draw conclusions. And and yeah, they're not favorable. And I think this is one of the reasons why I was less nervous than most people, because I knew what the rules were. And so I played to the rules and other people didn't. And other people said, well, I don't like that rule. So therefore, I'm not going to play to it. Okay. More for me. Thanks. Right. You just accept that I try to be a very engaging speaker. I try to be very energetic when I'm in front of a group, but not when I'm in church. Right. It's a completely different context. And interviewing is just a different context. And so, folks, we notice your appearance. When you come into our interviews and if you have a crummy portfolio and a nice suit or you're going interviewing for a nice job, we're going to notice. Okay. So look, let me go further. When you select the portfolio, make sure it matches. If you're wearing a black suit, a black portfolio is good. You don't need to pick something that will be fashionable necessarily or trendy. Interviews are about the hiring manager finding out what he wants to know to help him with deciding what you've done, how well you've done it, and to make sure that it's comparable to what he wants done. Anything else is a distraction. If you wear a suit or tie which stands out in any way other than that looks good on, you leave that hiring manager thinking about the suit and talking about the suit and not your skills and experience. Dress simply, allow the focus to be on your work, and that includes the one other thing outside of your physical clothes, which is the portfolio you carry. Good. Okay. So now we have this portfolio, which will hold, <laughs> in my mind, a quarter to a half inch worth of stuff. And I've got like six inches worth of stuff. So I just stuff it in this portfolio, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Big bulky thing that's bursting at the seams. Yeah. And by the way, um, something else I'll just mention. I, I know that we have a lot of folks in, in the technical community that listen to us. That's great. But your definition of a portfolio probably includes what amounts to an eight and a half by 11 zippered thing, like a day runner or a day planner would go into uh, a calendar with all kinds of, you know, pockets and things inside. And maybe it's, you know, it's got a half inch spine or something like that. And you've got three months worth of planner in there. And maybe you take the planner out and you say, Hey, here's a perfect portfolio. Not true. A portfolio that we're talking about does not have a zipper. So you can put a lot of stuff in it and zip it up and then keep your wallet and all that kind of stuff in there, right? The portfolio is simple. It, it, it opens like a book. You don't have to do anything to it to open unless it has one of those tabs that flaps that closes over the top. If the items we recommend cause it to bulge a little bit or not lay smooth and flat, consider buying a larger one or a little bit different shape. Although I can't imagine that is the case with the stuff that we've, we've recommended you put in there, right? And again, you don't bring everything, in, including the kitchen sink. The guidance is only bring what you need for the meeting. And frankly, you could bring less. Now, look, ladies, we totally understand you want to have a hairbrush and you want to be able to check your hair and your lipstick to just be just right before you go into the interview. You want to spare tissue. You want to, you, you, I mean, in some cases, you want to spare a pair of hose. Everything else a lady would carry in her purse, totally reasonable, but you're not going to fix your lipstick. You're not going to change the hose, your hose in this meeting. And yeah, it is weird to not walk around with a purse. We know that. And for this hour or two or three, you endure the weirdness. It's as simple as that. Okay. Now you might say to yourself, oh, I'm going to take my purse into the building, but just leave it with the secretary. And then I'm going to go to my three or four interviews and then I'll pick up my purse. Don't do it, right? You have to leave your purse in the car. And look, guys, holy moly, I'm, I'm amazed by this. Uh, guys, if you haven't already learned this, gentlemen, which you will want to be assumed you are in an interview, gentlemen, do not keep things in their pockets of their trousers. You don't need a pocket full of change. You don't need your wallet. You certainly don't need George Costanza's wallet. Oh my <laughs> gosh. The wallets I see professionals bring out of their, first of all, I see professionals reach into their back pocket of their suit. Gentlemen, the finest suits don't come, are the people who have bespoke suits made, they don't have back pockets, right? It's just extra material. And the reason they don't have them is they wouldn't put anything in them even if they did. Um, that's what your suit coat pocket is for. Or 
your wallet would go in your briefcase. So look, you, you don't put anything in your trouser pockets, front or back. Okay. It's not professional. It ruins the shape of your clothes. Yeah, frankly, we know what you're going to do if you have change or car keys on a ring in your pocket. You're going to play with them. So you empty your pockets. In fact, Mike and I at West Point, professors, one of their one of the steps that they had to go through before they presented in their in their military uniforms when they presented in class was empty all your pockets into the lap drawer of your desk in the front of the room so that you have nothing in your pockets. Not just because of noise, but also because it wasn't how gentlemen and even ladies present to other people. Okay, so empty your pockets. Now that said, what goes in the portfolio? Okay, easy, your resume. You need to have a copy of the resume you submitted for this role with you in the interview, okay? And if you're smart, it's one page, (laughs) okay? Look, not every hiring manager is organized, folks. If he asks you to walk through your resume or ask you a specific question and you hesitate, it leaves a poor impression, okay? Now, we don't recommend you take your resume out unless you're asked for it, okay? You never, ever take a note, something out. Uh, you, you, for instance, people ask me all the time, if I write down my questions to get ready for an interview, can I take the questions into the interview? Because I'm afraid I'm going to forget all my questions when it comes to my turn for asking questions. No, you don't. You have to memorize five questions. If you can't memorize five questions, what is that, a total of 100 words or something like that? You got no business being a professional, seriously. Now, look. There are hiring managers who will understand that you're nervous and you could say, I'm just going to get my resume out so I don't forget anything important. They would understand. We recommend you not do that. Okay. Now, the issue is make sure it's a copy of the resume you submitted for this job. Remember, we've talked about before about having a career development document and then tailoring your resume to each role you apply for. There's nothing worse than you walking through the resume you have in front of you in your head and then that being different to the one the hiring manager has. Uh, That said, if they ask you to walk through your resume, that does not mean you're going to be listing all of your accomplishments in reverse chronological order from the bottom to the top. You don't have time for that. That's a three to five minute answer. That's the same question as tell me about yourself. Okay. If you use a different resume than the one the hiring manager has, it makes you look inconsistent and the hiring manager is not going to draw a conclusion that it's a simple mistake. They're going to assume it's a, it's a, you're just not, you're trying to mislead them by giving a resume that makes you look good to get to the interview, but then a different resume to get through the interview. They might understand that you had different resumes for different jobs, but not two different resumes for two different steps in their process. No way. It's got to be the same one that you sent forward. And that means you have to keep track of them. And again, you ought to be able to keep track of it. Good. What else? The work history sheet. Uh, it's a simple text document with a list of all your previous employers on it. The dates you worked at each employer, their address, their phone number. For school, it includes the details of your exam subjects, your grades, uh, the, whether you passed or failed, you know, that kind of stuff, your GPA, schools you attended, and so on. And then the details of all of your references. Now, wh- why do you need that? I mean, are you going to pull this thing out and refer to it during the interview itself? I- no, absolutely not. Concern. Right. Okay. The same thing here. This is not a document. You, as a rule, you don't pull things out and refer to them in an interview. In fact, I've never done it. Yeah, you could do it in the case of presenting a, a piece of work product, but that happens one out of every hundred interviews, maybe every a thousand interviews. You know, in, in the uh, graphical design world, you might again have a portfolio, an artist portfolio, but other than that, no. Now, look, you might, you might say to yourself, work history sheet, gee, that's a lot of work. And it is, is the first time you do it, but it's really helpful in when you're in a job search. Many companies now, especially government agencies all over the world, require the completion of an application form in order to apply. And that sheet has much of the information you're going to need. It saves you looking it up every time. You may be put in a, in a, in a bullpen somewhere and asked to fill out an application for an hour. And yes, part of it is to look at your, your ability to print clearly and follow instructions and be detail oriented and so on. But that way you don't have to think, Oh dear God, I don't know the name of this company. I don't know their phone number or anything else. But if you've got it on a piece of paper, you look very well prepared. Hmm. So, so you may be asked to do that on, on site. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with a potential employer seeing you efficient and organized at all. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. That'd be good. Now look, 
have the job description for the job you, you've you been told you're interviewing for, if in fact it's there, right? There are occasions you get to the interview, the hiring manager doesn't know why you're there, or what she's interviewing you for. It happens. It's embarrassing for them. They ought to be mortified. They're not. They're not smart enough to be mortified at their own mistake. Or somebody else has to stand in for the person who's supposed to interview. They're disorganized. Having a copy of the job description is helpful. And look, it can help you. And and the way it would be helpful in that case is if somebody says, gee, I'm really sorry. I don't know what I'm interviewing you for. I say, I totally understand this stuff happens. Uh, It's for this job. And I said, if you want, uh, you know, I have a copy of the, the job description, if that's helpful. Oh my God, that'd be great. That'd be great. I'd love to see it. Then you hand them your job description for the job that you're interviewing for. Again, gotta be the right one. Don't take a folder with all of your job descriptions. In fact, we say a portfolio. Think of the portfolio as a folder, a single folder. It doesn't have subfolders in it with multiple companies stuff. It only has the cold down stack of papers that relate to this job. It can also help you, right? You go into the building, you refresh your memory of the role by reading through the job description. It may help calm you down a little bit and it brings the pertinent details of the job that you're interviewing for to the top of your mind. Now, the next thing is correspondence. This is one of those, to some degree, optional ones. We recommend you take the correspondence you've had with the company about this role. You could print out emails and so on, but you wouldn't have to do this if your conversations have all been with one or two people and it's been pretty clear which job and and it's just logistics and so on. But if there's been a lot of outsourcing in HR or recruiting and letters are sent out on, on the hiring manager's behalf or you've been dealing with a recruiting firm or something like that, the hiring manager may not have seen them. The job may have changed since the vacancy was open. The salary might be different or something. You may need to confirm who you're seeing or the address you were asked to go to. There Now with security being what it is, it wouldn't be a bad idea at all to have a printed email showing the email address of somebody in that company saying, here's when the interview is going to be and here's what it's for and so on. Look, folks, recruiting to some extent is like any other process in an organization. To us, right, to the interviewee, it feels special. It's a big deal, right? It's an opportunity. But internally, it's just one of those processes we have to do, right? And you're one of many probably being interviewed. And the fact is, sometimes processes go wrong. Sometimes when you order something online, the wrong item is sent or goes to the wrong address or the credit card is rejected for who knows what reason. Sometimes the recruiting process goes wrong and having the correspondence with you will help you clear up any misunderstanding. That said, if it's been a fairly short and sweet sort of communication, you probably don't need all that stuff. And if you've got 20 pages of correspondence, you have too many. Okay, Probably four or five is all you would need. Next, and this one always, I'm amazed that people don't have this, but but I think that's probably just me being myopic a little bit. Um, You need a photo ID. Okay. I mentioned security. Many offices will not allow visitors in without photo ID. It's funny though. There are places, Mike, you and I have been in the last year or so where clients tell us, look, security is really tight here. And then you happen to be the first one there with the night guard. And the night guard's like, yeah, sure. I, you, you tell them, hey, we're here to train for XYZ. We're manager tools. Oh yeah. Go on up there on the yeah, 18th floor, on, on the 14th floor. And I mean, there was no scanner. There was no anything, right? It's it's funny. And then other places, they don't tell you anything, and and security is bizarre, right? I remember once that my my um, driver's license was expired, and actually, I had a newer one, but but um, I showed them the expired one, and so I'm sorry, sir, I can't let you in. That's expired ID. I said, well, how about a passport? And they said, well, I don't know if that's official government. <laughs> I said, <laughs> Well, let me show it to you. Maybe you'll be okay with it. So yeah, you've got to have photo ID with you. And some recruitment offices, they require photo ID, proof of address or other documentation. So make sure your your, your driver's license in the States is, is, is up to date. Or if it's not up to date, make sure that if mail is sent there, that you, it, it will be forwarded to you. If you've just moved in the last week, don't tell them, no, that address isn't right. Because they're going to say, well, then that's not an official photo ID. Make sure you dot your I's and cross your T's on that one. Next, this is so easy. You've got to have something to write with and you've got to have something to write on, okay? And look, it's not a big pen. It's not a piece of crap pen, folks. There should be, it should be a nice pen. You don't have to go out and spend 500 bucks or even a hundred bucks. You don't need a Montblanc pen. You don't need a, uh, what Mike and I write with, a, a Parker vintage pen. You, you don't. 
probably not a clicky pin, right? One with a little thing on the top that clicks. Although that could be okay if it's nice. Yeah, as long as you're able to resist the... Uh yeah, the, the temptation to temptation constantly to be click it yeah. 20 times during the interview. Yeah. Yeah. And um, in this case, it, you don't put the pen in the portfolio. You put it in your suit pocket or something like that. And, and, and not in your pants pocket, but in your suit pocket, in your coat pocket. But you never know when a hiring manager might give you some information you need to write down. He might give you his email address. He might give you his direct line, which isn't written on his card or his cell phone number. Right. Hey, and let me give you my cell phone number. Okay. Can you give me a pen and piece of paper first? Ouch. Yeah. Right. He might give you a reference number to quote when you inquire, right? Here's your case. This interview is part of case 2492. And, you know, you'll need to tell them that when you ask, because I'm required to enter data in, into our system online. It's stupid, but hey, if it's stupid, but it's their system, you want to work within their system. Look, he, he might ask you to write something down just to see whether or not you've got a pen and a piece of paper. Look, folks, even if you're a new graduate, there is no excuse for having a chewed up crummy pin in your portfolio. Spend 20 cents or a buck or two bucks on a brand new pin and make sure it writes and not too fat and not one with three different colors. Okay. New graduates can probably get away with something from Staples or Office Max, but if you're more senior, you need a nicer pin. And look, when it comes to paper, you can have just a couple of pieces of, uh, note paper, small piece of note paper that's like, uh, oh, let's say it's four inches by five inches, which is a quarter sheet of roughly a quarter sheet of eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. You could even cut up an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper into four sheets of, you know, four quarter sheets and put those and you could, pro- you could slide them into the portfolio. You could put a, a blank, not eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper into your portfolio, just one. And that's enough. That's all you need. And that won't add virtually any weight at all. Um, next thing is, this is a funny one. Um, I'm always surprised about this. Your, your car key. Look, ladies, we've told you to leave your purse behind. We've told men, you got to empty your pockets. You're going to be leaving them in, you're going to leave that stuff in your car. And yet your car needs, needs to obviously stay locked. Slip your car key off of the ring and place it alone in the portfolio. Don't take your house key. Don't take those 20 other keys. I personally happen to hate keys. I just don't, I don't like carrying them around. Just the one you need to get back into your car, right? And look, if you travel by bus or by subway or whatever, your, your transport card or your ticket can be slipped into the portfolio. Of course, that's fine. But, but look, just a single key. Now, I know some keys on some cars now, the non-working in, the handle end is kind of big. If that makes your portfolio bulge, guys, you can open the, the, um, the outside pocket of your suit coat and put your key in there. If it's a single key, you're probably fine. Now, I, I'll tell you a funny thing about keys. I'm amazed at people who tell me, no, I really need to take all my keys. No, dude, you don't because none of the keys in there will open anything in this building, right? The keys by definition are moot. The next thing is people tell me, oh, well, I'm sorry. I have to take all of them. I can't, I don't know how to take my keys off the ring or this key is kind of special. It's hard. It's a, it's a BMW key and you, you'll see that it's got this special fob on it and everything I'm like, oh, geez, you need to know how to do that. That's a pretty standard adult behavior. You need to know how to do that. And something else too, this is true for ladies as well as for men. If you open up your suit coat or if you, you, you lift the flap on your suit coat pocket, the outside, not the inside breast pockets, but the outside and this, the pocket appears to be sewn shut. It is sewn shut, but it's sewn shut to help it keep its shape on the rack and to, to make it lay flat. Okay. Those pockets are pockets. They're not just flaps. All you have to do is, is get a sharp knife, even better, a seam ripper if you have one, but I suspect 99.999% of the people don't have a seam ripper. Just get a very sharp knife, find where there's a little bit of gap, put your knife in there and saw uh, or cut one of those first, uh, the, one of the threads that are holding it two together. And then once you cut one of them, you can just gradually work it out and you can open up both sides and then make sure the only thing that goes in there is a key. Uh, Typically when I present in front of an audience, if I have a suit coat on, the only thing I have in one of my pockets is my hotel room key, which now looks like a credit card, of course. That's all. And anything more than that, don't put your wallet in there. Don't put your phone in there. Um, Anything more than that will distort the line of your, your suit coat. On the other hand, that's what it's there for. And one key will not look bad at all. 
But if it looks like there are pockets, there are pockets. If it looks like they're sewn shut, they are. And they're sewn shut for a reason. And you're supposed to open them. <laughs> that It's provided to you that way. And then you're supposed to open it. It's like trying to use it. If you don't cut that seam, it's a bit like trying to use a computer while it's still in the box. It doesn't work. Right. Now, one more thing. Doesn't apply to that many people. Okay. This is the least likely thing to apply to you. And that is examples of your work in specific cases. It's only true for some professions, right? Some professions are more based on specific work than others. Artists, designers, architects, engineers, creative people in advertising might be asked, might be asked to bring examples of their work, or you may want to, but please folks be cautious. Bring the work if you want, but only show it to the hiring manager if she asks for it. Those of us who have interviewed have all had the awkward moment where someone says, can I show you my work? And of course, you feel obliged to say yes. Well, okay, not all of us feel obliged to say yes. I say, no, thank you. You mean when I ask people whether they want to see my holiday photos or my trip to Hawaii that, and they say yes, yeah. they didn't really mean it? They really, yeah. It's really? Like, like a boss I had once that told mm. one of her assistants, said, look, I want you to understand something. Every morning I ask you, how are you? And uh, the other day you didn't say fine. You told me about things at home. You had a rough day at home. And, and uh, I, want, I want you to understand something. When I ask how you're doing, I don't really mean it. <laughs> it's just politeness. I don't really care how you're doing. So you don't need to actually tell me how you're doing. The appropriate thing is just to say fine. <laughs> yeah. So look, don't bring it out unless you're specifically asked for it. Okay. Only show if you're asked and make sure they're good examples, by the way. Uh, and, and by the way, if you think that it has to be bigger, you, you better be in the creative world or in the design world or something, because generally speaking, you don't want an 11 by 14, you don't want, you know, 18 by 24 sort of sleeves portfolios to show. If they've asked for that, then that's fine. But if you're interviewing for a graphic design job, you could actually ask, do I need to bring my portfolio? And in that case, they're talking about something larger if, in fact, you normally would produce something larger. But frankly, some of you get away with not having it in the first interview, and they only look at it in the second interview. Yeah. Okay, so that's a list of things to bring. Are, are there any things you'd recommend specifically that somebody doesn't bring? Yeah, everything else in the world. <laughs> <laughs> It's, you know, look, if it's not on the list, don't take it. The one thing we want to be specific about is don't take your phone. Please, please, please don't take your phone into the interview. Leave it in your car outside. I promise you. I I, I asked a group recently. I, I want to say it was in, in D.C. I asked a group recently that we were talking about email. Uh, we were coaching a bunch of executives. And I said, look, you, you're addicted to email. And they're all like, yeah, not really. And I said, okay, how, raise your hand if you've ever, um, particularly for you gentlemen who who keep your phone on your belt, and uh, raise your hand if you have thought you had an email because your phone buzzed or you thought you had a phone call because your phone buzzed and you reached down and your phone wasn't where you got a buzz feeling and they all raised their hand. Uh, you know, it's called sympathetic. It's actually a physical ailment, phys sympathetic buzzing on, on your body. Is, is that the, the the technical term? Sympathetic buzzing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, not buzzing, but it's sympathetic <laughs> something or other. Yeah, I didn't and, think and the, so. Uh, yeah, and the point is, is that, I mean, you, it's going to happen in the interview and you're going to be distracted and you're going to miss the question or you're going to get distracted on your answer. It's just amazing. Where there's no need to have your phone with you. Don't take it with you. Look. If you use it for calendaring or to keep other information, write down the other information, print out your calendar for the next month and put it in your portfolio. Don't take your phone to an interview, period. Okay. And then, uh, you know, what not take everything else, everything else is not on the list. Don't take it. Folks, we've thought about this list carefully. Wendy and I have interviewed tens of thousands of people. You're likely to be in an interview for no more than an hour, maybe 90 minutes, maybe two at the outside. There's very little you can't do without for two hours. If there are things that you feel like you can't do without for two hours, you need to get your head right around the importance of this interview and what not not to be happening during the interview, which is thinking about anything other than interviewing, right? Okay. If there's medication, you might need to take an emergency. Okay. Take one or two pills out of the bottle. Okay. It doesn't need to be in the bottle. 
put it in something small in, in a small um, envelope or something like that and and put that in the uh, in the portfolio as well. Interviews are stressful. Don't add to your stress. Use this cast as a simple checklist as what to take and take one thing off your plate. And one more, I want to add one more uh, piece of uh, guidance. And that is if you have more than 20 sheets of paper in your portfolio, you probably have too many. And you've probably misunderstood some of our guidance or we weren't clear enough. And so if you get that, send us an email, show at manager-tools.com. And we'll be happy to, to answer um, why or, or tell you what, what where our guidance was misleading or where you got off track in terms of having too many things in that portfolio. Okay, Good. that's it. So take that portfolio, put your resume, your work history sheet, job description, correspondence, pen and small notebook paper, your car key, not keys, uh, examples of your works work in rare specific cases, and don't take your phone or anything else not on this list. Awesome. That's it. It's it, look, look. It's just one thing. This, this is we want to forget about this. We want to make this second nature. You put this stuff in there, and you forget about it. you've got the right stuff. If anybody asks you, you say, "I got what I need. I don't need to take anything else." And then don't forget it when you're interviewing. If you're going through a series of interviews during the day, <laughs> yeah. you look professional. You have what you need, and you're less stressed exactly. throughout the interviews. Yeah, when you have what you need, and you have, and you don't have anything you don't need. Exactly right. Excellent. Thanks, my friend. You bet, partner. We'll see you. Thanks, everyone. That's it. We'll see you again next week. So long. <laughs>